Uh, okay, guys, let us start the seminar. Um, hello, uh, my name is Yermiak. Uh, he is Evgeny and Alexei. And uh, yes, if, if you have any questions or you have technical issues, you can ask us. So uh, our seminar will be dedicated to Gaussian process. Actually, there will be two parts. The, the, uh, in the first part, we will um, consider some how, how we can uh, work with Gaussian process in Python. And in the second part, uh, we will consider um, Bayesian optimization. So um, in Python, we will propose to use GPy library. Uh, it's not ideal, but I think it is the best one uh, among free libraries in Python. Um, it is uh, flexible, it has a lot of uh, GP models implemented, a lot of kernel functions and so on. So uh, if you uh, haven't, in haven't installed it yet, so please run just pip install gpy and that's it. Um, and here is a brief reminder about Gauss Gaussian process regression model. So we are solving a regression uh, problem and this means that we have data set x, y um, where y is um, y uh, is a continuous um, variable. Uh, here for simplicity we suppose that it is one dimensional um, and we suppose, we assume that y is some function, some f of x plus epsilon where f of x is a Gaussian process and epsilon is a Gaussian noise with zero mean and some unknown variance. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what, we, what we want next is uh, we want to derive a posterior distribution of value y star at new point x star given our, our data set x and y. And uh, in our assumption that f of x is a Gaussian process. This uh, posterior distribution is also Gaussian with some mean function uh, m of x and some covariance function sigma of x which are given by these expressions. Uh, what is important here, uh, I think that this expression uh, for predictive mean, uh, actually predictive mean is a weighted sum of kernel functions k of x. And uh, actually this means that uh, we take the kernel function, place it at, e at each training point x, y, and then take the weighted sum. So for example, if we, if we use RBF kernel, this means that at each training point we put this Gaussian bell uh, at each training point, and then we take the wa weighted sum. So I think this is uh, important to understand uh, the predictions of our, of our GP model. So, okay, uh, now let us generate some simple one-dimensional problem. Actually, it's some sine plus cosine plus uh, some noise. So here are 10 points which, which are uniformly distributed in 0, 1 interval. Okay, to, uh, to to create GP model, the first step is to define the kernel function or the covariance function. Uh, the most widely used covariance function is called RBF for radial basis function. Actually, it is exponent of the square distance between points divided by some length scale. Uh, in GPy, you can uh, create the kernel using gpy.kern module, and there there is an RBF. Uh, uh, RBF class, so uh, you should provide the input dimension, that is dimension of x, and some initial uh, values of, the, of its parameters, the variance and the length scale. Uh, and after that, we create our model using gpy.models module and using gp regression class. And we should um, pass the training set and the kernel that we have defined. 
Uh, okay, and here you, you can print the model. It, it will show you some useful information. You can plot the model. And the, our initial model looks like this. So here we uh, did not, we didn't tune any hyperparameters like the length scale of the, of the kernel, like um, uh, noise variance and so on. And so our initial model, it looks like this. So we have large variance and some uh, not very accurate prediction. So um, <clears throat> now let's look at the parameters of the covariance function. So the most important for parameter for RBF kernel is its length scale, L. And if we plot it for a different length scale, we will obtain uh, such plots. So for uh, small values of length scale, we'll obtain some narrow kernel like this, and for uh, large values of length scale, we will obtain uh, wide kernels like this. And so it is obvious that this is important parameter at uh, uh, it will uh, affect the, the predictive model. So the first task here for you is to create some RBF kernel. Um, uh, set some initial length scale and try to guess uh, which length scale will fit the best for for the generated data set. So I would like to remind you that the, we have 10 points. They are sampled uniformly in 0, 1 intervals. So uh, maybe you have some suggestions which length scale should we use. Any assumptions? Okay, what? Yes, which length scale? That is the width of the kernel function. O point what? O point two. Okay, uh, why O point two? <laughs> okay, uh, the, actually the um, the answer here is very simple. So um, uh, the length scale should be proportional to the should be close to um, to distance between uh, between two points. Uh, so let's do it. Uh, okay, uh, so actually it's not, I think that 0 0.5, 0 0.1 will, will fit well. Um, so you can try to uh, set some large value in T and see how it affects the model. So in this case we uh, obtain very smooth model, uh, which is more close to linear. And if we, if we use some uh, small length scale, we'll obtain something like this. That is, we just put very, very narrow uh, RBF kernels uh, at, each, at each training point, and that is why we have this, this, these narrow peaks uh, at the training points. So, um, uh, actually, this is what we usually do when we use SVM. We just uh, try to change the kernel par parameters manually or using some grid search or some other uh, optimizations. We should, do, and we, should, we should do it manually, but in GPI you can do the following. You, can, you just um, define your model and use optimize method, which inside maximizes the uh, log likelihood of the GP model. So, uh, okay. So let's... Uh, uh, 
Yeah, the, yeah, this is it. Um, so we have, we obtain um, we obtain uh, so we we can see that RBF length scale is 0 0.13, which is close to 0 0.1, our guess. Uh, and uh, there is some um, very good estimation of uh, noise variance. And so this is a quite good model. Uh, now uh, let's look at, no at noise variance uh, parameter. So tr here try to uh, choose some very small value, some very large value, and see how, how uh, it affects the model. So for, for example, if we if we uh, set it to like 10, uh, we'll obtain the model which is almost linear. So actually noise variance act acts like a regularization for GP models. And if we take, if we take some very small, some small value, we'll obtain the interpolation. That is our prediction will uh, pass through all the training points. Um, so here, so let's now let's generate more points with, with more noise and uh, feed the model. And the figure will look like this. That is, we obtain some reasonable approximation with some reasonable confidence bounds. But now, if we try to change the noise variance to some small value, like 0.01, uh, we'll obtain the something uh, very noisy, very, very noisy approximation. So this is because uh, our model tries to uh, tries tries to uh, approximate the training the training set exactly. Uh, okay, here's another task for you. It is very simple. Uh, so we just have some multi-dimensional. Uh, multi-dimensional function in this case. In 2D, it looks like this. Uh, this data, this training set, it is three-dimensional. So what I propose here to do is to uh, create the model by yourself from the scratch. That is, define the RBF, fun, RBF kernel, uh, create the model, and optimize it. And, uh, and after that, you in this cell, you can uh, check the model, that is, you generate some test set, calculate the mean square error, and uh, it should be small. Uh, so try to do it. Okay, so we obtained 0.2. Um, maybe, so um, actually, this optimization, when we use optimization, we have inside some stochasticity. For example, because we use some random initial, uh, random initial gears and so on. And uh, sometimes to improve the, uh, to improve the uh, solution of this optimization problem, we should do multi-start. Uh, in GPA, it can be done like this. We just use optimize restarts method. It has uh, the the most important parameter is number of restarts. We can set it to five, for example, and uh, run the optimization again. So, so we can see that at the first iteration we obtained some very large value for negative log likelihood. And uh, at the second iteration, we obtained a much better model. And this is it. We obtained the MSE, MSE which is about 1 to the 10 to the negative 5. So now let's uh, move to the, um, to the kernel functions. So um, you can print the kernel function, and it, it, uh, it will show you the parameters, its values, constraints and so on. You can also plot the kernel function using plot method. So RBF function looks like this. This is a Gaussian bells. However, so the RBF kernel, it's the uh, most widely used kernel. But uh, there, in real life, you will encounter more complex uh, functions. Uh, for example, here are heaviside function and restricting function. So let's plot them. Uh, so one function actually is 
um, this function is actually it's a discontinuous function. This function is continuous and smooth, but it has a lot of peaks and it is very wiggly. And uh, actually, these functions uh, cannot be well approximated using RBF kernel. So we can just try to do it. For example, for heavy side function, we will always obtain something like this. Uh, you, c you can observe the oscillations uh, nearby the this discontinuity. This is because we try we are trying to approximate discontinuous function using infinitely continuous functions. So this is this is not good. Uh, now let us try to approximate the restricting function. In this case, we will obtain something like this. Uh, over smoothed, this is an over smoothed approximation of the restricting function. Uh, basically, actually, the GP thinks that there is so this uh, there is a lot of noise in the data set, and this is why we just approximate the trend uh, of the function. Um, hopefully. Uh, Fortunately, uh, there are a lot of other covariance functions. Here is some list of the of the most popular. Um, uh, they all have different properties. Uh, for example, there is a linear function, there is a periodic function to model some periodicity, uh, exponential function, this function which is not smooth, um, and so on. Uh, so just let's plot them to see how they look like. Uh, so some of uh, some of the functions like these Matern th three two uh, and rational quadratic, uh, they uh, all look very similar to each other. Yes, question. Sorry, the covariance matrix, what? Um, can I easily select the covariance matrix corresponding to a particular autoregressive uh, process of a particular order or the moving average pro? I mean, I can reparameterize, of course, but is there an easy way? Uh, so you just need to define properly the kernel function. Uh, but um, so you should you should introduce some 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 kind of um, time I think and the uh, and the shifts and so on. But actually, I, I I didn't I didn't see examples of how how it can be done uh, using kernels. I think that it can be done, but um, actually I didn't see such examples. Uh, so uh, we have uh, we have a list of base kernels, uh, but and we can construct more complex kernels by using two operations. Um, for example, we can not two but several other operations. For example, we can uh, sum uh, several kernels and we can take product of kernels. Uh, in both cases, we will obtain some uh, valid kernel. Uh, let's plot uh, some examples. So here we can see, uh, for example, the linear kernel plus periodic kernel. Uh, for example, periodic kernel multiplied by RBF kernel, and so on. Uh, another way to construct uh, more complex kernels is using the additive model. That is, suppose that our function f of x, uh, it is uh, sum of functions uh, which depend only on one element of x, plus sum of functions which depends on a pair of a pair or pairs of elements of x, and so on. And in this, actually, this corresponds to uh, the sum of kernels, where one kernel depends on uh, only the one element of the inputs. Um, uh, second kernel depends on some other set of other subset of uh, input dimensions, and so on. 
Um, and here is an, is an example of such uh, sum of RBF kernels. And you can see that it doesn't look like the usual two-dimensional RBF kernel. It, it looks uh, different, differently. Uh, okay. And actually, if uh, you have some objects that are not vectors, for example, can be graphs, some strings, and so on, you actually can define the kernel for kernels for such objects. The most simple way to do it is to hum somehow define the distance uh, between these objects and then um, take some transformation. For example, uh, take exponent uh, of this distance or something like this. Okay, so uh, by now uh, we suppose that we have defined some complex kernel. Uh, so what, uh, to understand what kind of functions can be approximated by these kernels, uh, by this kernel you can first uh, plot the kernel and second, uh, which is also interesting, is to uh, sample some random function uh, using this kernel. So actually when, uh, when you use GP model, uh, you define some distribution over functions. And it means that you can draw a random function from this dis distribution. The procedure is simple. You just generate a set of points x on some grid, for example, and then you calculate the mean, uh, the mean uh, function for each point, for each x. You calculate the covariance matrix between uh, this set of points. Uh, and after that, you sample a random vector from multivariate normal distribution uh, with this mean vector and the uh, covariance matrix. And this will, us, will, give, uh, us, will give us actually one random function. And here's the code that uh, does this. Uh, let's run it. So here are just three random functions which were generated using RBF kernel. Uh, you can change RBF kernel for some other kernel, for example, um, exponential. And we'll see that exponential kernel is uh, most used for uh, this kind of uh, functions. Uh, okay. Okay, here's the more complex task for you. Here's a data set of airline passenger counts. Actually, it is a one-dimensional time series. Uh, let's run this cell. So the data set looks like this. Uh, you have some gap uh, here. Uh, what you need to do is to construct approximation of using this data set and you should obtain something like this. That is, the function should uh, reasonably interpolate uh, the data set here, and we uh, should have some reasonable extrapolation, some reasonable prediction uh, in the future. And we should um, also um, Uh, so catch the structure, that is the trend, the periodicity, seasonality, and so on. So um, if you use just RBF kernel, uh, it will not work. Let's try. So actually, RBF kernel just uh, catches, catches the trend. And all this periodicity, it is, um, uh, it's actually, it's, it's a noise for, for RBF kernel. So we can see here that Gaussian noise variance is uh, 2000. So um, what they propose to do is to model this data set uh, using this structure. We will use some additive kernel, which will consist of three components. Uh, the first component will model the trend. 
The second component will model this periodicity, seasonality, and the third component, component uh, will model the noise uh, in our data set. Um, okay, uh, do you have some suggestions on how to model the trend? So, yes, linear, linear, but, and they also propose to add some small um, non-linearity by taking the linear kernel plus RBF kernel. Actually, there can be a lot of solutions to this problem, uh, and I will show you just one of them. You can find uh, some other solution, and it can, be, it can differ from mine. So, okay, uh, here I, uh, actually in GPI there is a linear kernel, um, but I don't use linear kernel, I use polynomial kernel with order one, uh, because linear kernel, kernel in GPI doesn't include bias term, so it, al it always passes through zero. Uh, it, is, it is not very convenient, so I use polynomial kernel of order one, uh, and uh, add some, add RBF kernel. And the result looks like this, so uh, almost the same as with just RBF kernel. Um, now let's model the periodicity. So um, actually just periodic kernel uh, will not be enough. Uh, guess why? So any, any assumptions? Uh, not exactly, no. Uh, you, can, you can plot the periodic kernel and uh, see how it looks. Yeah, why just periodic kernel is not enough to model the periodicity? Yes. Uh, actually, the, there was a right answer here. So if you plot the periodic kernel, you can notice that the, ampli the amplitude of the kernel doesn't change. Uh, so actually, we have um, almost the same amplitude. So just, just let's, let's plot it. Uh, so it looks like this. So we have uh, the same amplitude. This is just periodic kernel with the constant amplitude. And remember that uh, the prediction of Gaussian process is the weighted sum of, um, of kernel functions. So if we take the weighted sum of such functions, so uh, it's, it, it will be really um, tri difficult to approximate the sum uh, periodic function using this periodic function because um, actually we have we we have some periodicity but the amplitude increases with time and we should take it into account. So what I propose to do uh, is the following. Uh, I propose to okay so. The, the trend kernel will be the same. We just copy it from the previous cell. Uh, to model seasonality, I will take the periodic kernel, multiply it by linear kernel. And this will give gives us some kernel with the increasing amplitude. Uh, 
so the kernel looks like this, but it is also not enough because the amplitude will increase to infinity. This is not good, and this is why I also multiply it by RBF kernel to, uh, in order to make it uh, decreasing with, 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 with X. So we will, we will use the kernel that looks like this to model the seasonality, and the result will look like this. So it is not what we want. Um, actually, we obtain some interpolation here, but we uh, predict we can focus nothing. Uh, the reason for this is that there we, the noise model that we use, uh, it is not right. Uh, we suppose that the noise variance is constant for each training, for each training point of the data set. But it is not true. Uh, if you look at our data set, we can notice that the noise, uh, noise variance, it actually increases with time. So we should model it using some other kernel. Uh, uh, okay, so trend and seasonal uh, models, kernels will be the same. Okay, uh, but to, to model the noise, we'll use the uh, white noise kernel. So white noise kernel actually the, supposes that that uh, at each training point the so we have a constant noise variance that is uh, that is uh, that is white noise kernel, but to uh, to to model our noise which has increasing variance with time we should multiply it by linear kernel. Okay. And finally, we obtained the model that we wanted to construct. So, the, so to, to conclude, we, we need to model trend, we need to model seasonality, and we, uh, we, uh, we have to have some uh, right kernel to model the noise in your data set. So, uh, um, Actually, in this case, the, it was rather simple because we just the variance of the noise it just increased linearly. But in more complex cases, uh, this these dependence will be not linear; it can be much more complex, and it is kind of hard to uh, to to create the right kernel to model the noise. Uh, Okay, so what was what we have question? Gaussian process is the distribution of uh, functions. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Orange function is an expectation, and this blue uh, blue area is the confidence uh, intervals of of the. Um, I'm not sure, but some kind. Ah, okay. Yes, I can repeat it. So the I think the the trend kernel is simple and is rather clear. So we just use linear kernel plus RBF. RBF is just to model some uh, small non-linearity in the trend. 
Um, now the uh, the periodic kernel. So uh, just just STD periodic kernel is not enough because it looks like this. It has constant amplitude. And the, in our data set, the amplitude increases with time. So what, what I did is I multiplied the periodic kernel by a linear kernel. Uh, and this result in the, in, the kern, in the periodic kernel with increasing amplitude. Uh, but it is also not enough because the amplitude always increases and it can increase to infinity. And it is not good. We need we so the kernel should be local, and this is why we multiply it by RBF kernel. Okay. And the next step is to model the noise in the data set. So um, in our data set, noise variance uh, it uh, it is not constant for every point. It increases with time. That is why we you take white kernel uh, in which the noise variance is constant and multiply it by linear kernel to make it to, uh, to make the kernel in which the, this variance it increases with time. And that's it. After that, we just take the sum of these three kernels and obtain this model. Okay. Other questions? Um, why we plot the the model on the training set? Uh, we we can do it. We cannot do it. We actually what we are interested in is the uh, is uh, this this gap in the training set and the prediction for future moments of time. Why we, no, why we, when we, ah, you mean the whole. Uh, sorry, m maybe it's uh, just bug in the IPython notebook. Uh, I, re I really, maybe I just didn't notice. No, we we use X train and Y train. X train and Y train they are defined. Um, they are defined in this cell. Yeah, and yes, yes, we didn't use this. The, the points that are here. Ah, we use the training set that we have. So uh, during the lectures there was a question. Uh, on why Gaussian process, so we optimize the hyperparameters using the likelihood which is calculated on the training set and why it does not uh, overfit in this case. Uh, the answer uh, is the following. The actual likelihood has this uh, data fit term which is uh, 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 which is minus uh, white transpose k to the negative one uh, y. Uh, sorry? Uh, y, y is a column Y is a column, Y1, Yn, okay? And we, y, we take Y transpose, multiply by K inverse, multiply by Y, uh, and then we should uh, subtract the griffon of the determinant uh, of the kernel of the kernel of the covariance matrix. So this term is actually the data fit term. This is how, uh, how good we approximate the training set. And this term, the logarithm of the determinant, it, it uh, acts like the complexity term. 
so in 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 the this log likelihood we have some this trade-off be between the data feed and the complexity of, of our model. Uh, uh, okay. So what we did in, in this example manually, that is constructing the, the such complex kernel, actually it can be done automatically uh, using some some grid search or something like this. So the idea is very simple. So we would like to construct some complex kernel which looks like this. Some, some kernel which models the trend, the, period, the seasonality and some residuals uh, and so on. So, and actually to construct the kernels, uh, we we used the following. We used some list of base kernels like polynomial, RBF, periodic, and so on. And we have two operations, the summation uh, and the product of the kernels. And we can do uh, some kind of grid search. So uh, uh, at initial step, we can, uh, using uh, each of base kernels, we can construct the, the model. And use and choose the best the kernel with with the best score. So to calculate score, um, reasonable candidate can be the Bayesian information criterion, which looks like this. It's minus log likelihood plus m m multiplied by log n. So this is the uh, the the data feed term. This term. Uh, it controls the complexity of the model. Uh, okay, so we have constructed, we have chosen, we have chosen some one kernel. After that, we can uh, take uh, iteratively one by one each kernel from the list of base kernels, apply one, apply the operations from our algebra like. Uh, add this kernel or multiply it kernel to the previously constructed kernel. Uh, and for each new kernel, we can calculate this Bayes information criterion, choose the best one, uh, and then take the next step, and so on and so on. And this, uh, this greedy procedure uh, uh, can be used to uh, construct such kernel, such complex kernels uh, more or less automatically. So here's a task for you, uh, but I think that um, it will be a bonus task. So what I propose here is to move to the second part, to Bayesian optimization. Uh, so do you have any questions on, uh, on this, on the previous part of the seminar? Yeah, question. Um, intuition behind the pluses and multiplication, it can be the following. When you add two kernels, you suppose that your function, the actual, the true function, uh, is, a sum, is a sum of two functions. Each function is modeled by the, the specific kernel. Uh, when you take the product of, uh, two, uh, of two kernels, uh, it is equivalent to the product of Gaussian process uh, in case uh, when the Gaussian process have zero mean. So the intuition is just like this. Okay, other, other questions? Okay, and then let's move to the second part, to Bayesian optimization. Okay, thank you, Ermek. And now we continue with the second part and with the second presenter, it's me. Okay, so you should open the second notebook you have. It's uh, GPI opt with underscore in the middle. Yeah, you, you, can, you can see it, uh, what, what is this at the top here. Maybe you can sh a bit increase it. Yeah. And now what we are going to do for the second part as for the first part, we tried to solve a regression problem on how to construct a regression model using 
Gaussian process regression. In the second part, we will try to optimize something uh, using approach based on Gaussian process regression called Bayesian optimization. And uh, what we will do, we will try to solve the problem for one-dimensional example, a simple function commonly used uh, in such examples. And in the second part, we will try to optimize hyperparameters of some uh, classification model. Uh, particular model is uh, a gradient boosting model from LightGBM library. Okay, so let's start from the overview of what, 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 uh, what library should we use. Okay, let's start, excuse me, let's start from this part. So, when and why we should use Bayesian optimization? Uh, in most cases, uh, if you are doing some kind of optimization, you know little about the function. The function is like, okay, maybe it's convex, maybe it's not. We know nothing, it has some noise. And also what's important is that each evaluation costs you money. So you will try to make as small number of evaluation as possible but uh, with little knowledge about what your function is. So this is a setting, the Bayesian optimization works good because it constructs a regression model, a very general one, and it takes into account uncertainty of our regression model. So the general workflow, and we will follow later with each step of it, is to construct uh, some kind of regression model then find uh, maximum of some equalization function, calculate our function at this new point selected by maximization of equalization function, and then add this pair to the sample and continue uh, as long as you have money or time or whatever, whatever else constraints you have. A good example of uh, equalization function is upper constant bound. In this case, if you set beta to zero here, then you have just, okay, let's just optimize our model of our function f. It's f hat, for example, it can come from uh, Gaussian process regression or random forest or whatever. But uh, in this case, most of the time we will focus on some small region and in this region we will continue to evaluate our function which is not good, for example, if our function has multiple optima. So it's reasonable to add some penalty, and not a penalty, but instead, let's try to put more attention to the regions where we have high uncertainty of our model. So in this uh, accusation function, uncertainty comes into play in a direct way, and to even have a coefficient to say on how much attention do we pay to the function, and to the uncertainty we have now. And uh, there is some theoretical papers on how to select this parameter. Uh, gen in a general way, you should uh, modify it with uh, steps. But uh, for example, in GPIOPT library, you can only set one beta. And uh, in many cases, this approach works well if you select a good value of beta. Uh, another example of accusation function is expected improvement. I hope you heard the definition during the lecture. But let's uh, see some figure on how this function usually looks like. This is uh, not some unusual figure, it is what you usually have. So you have some, for example, two-dimensional x, and you want to select a new point to evaluate uh, our function at it. And you see that uh, this optimization problem is not very good because uh, it looks like that uh, in the most of the region we want to optimize, this function is almost constant. It's the first problem. And the second problem is that uh, we have multiple local optima, this one, this one, this guy, so on. So the second problem, and the first problem we can solve using a logarithm of expected improvement at most of the packages for Bayesian optimization do the simple trick to do Bayesian optimization better. So now it's not, it does not look like a constant, but 
it has many local optima. So usually we just do some kind of restart, and we will see later how to do this in code. Uh, there are a number of libraries on how to do this. We will use GPI opt based on GPI, we saw in the previous seminar. So let's finally look at some code and not just listen to what I am doing. Actually, there is a lot of alternative code for your specific problems available at this link. A lot of notebooks targeted at different optimization problem, different settings, for example, multiple outputs, or whatever. Okay, we will need two libraries here. Uh, actually, this one is for sampling. It's a rather good one. Uh, and GPIOpt uses this library for sampling internally to optimize some acquisition function that requires uh, approximate inference. And also we need this uh, GPIOpt library. I hope yeah, it should be installed here. So, okay, please run. I hope it's yeah, and for me, it's okay now. Now let's import all, all we need here. All libraries are standard, except gpyopt. Okay. And also, um, I have another function here in the folder. It's called, uh, uh, called utility, and we will use some auxiliary functions to make the process faster and better in terms of that you should acquire some knowledge, don't write a lot of NumPy code, or even just pure Python code. So let's go finally to the code here. And this example is actually available in GPIOpt. You can just load it, and you see what's, what function should look like. You see that we have for this function called Forrester function uh, evaluator, so we can evaluate this function at any point. You have uh, something like bound here, and you can plot this function to see that it's a function that should be a good example for Bayesian optimization here. We have uh, multiple local optimum, and uh, it may be not easy to find uh, the good one if you use standard algorithms. Okay, so now we have the function, and uh, to finally define the problem, we need to specify in what region do we search for the local optimum? In this case, we run the following code. We define the space we live in by identification of names for variables. It's here, just x. Identification of types of variables. In this case, it's continuous. So it's like from zero to one, and it can take any value from this interval. Note that for uh, GPIOp, there are more options available. For example, you can say that uh, actually this variable is discrete or even categorical. And so you have this space, define it as a, okay, a list of Python dicks. You can define finally the design region, one dimension in this case. Also, a good idea is to have some initial sample. Here, in this case, we generate it in a random way. Okay, if you have some questions, you can ask me, for sure. So, at this point, we will evaluate points. In, we evaluate the function initially, then construct the model, and then refine and optimize the function we need. This is just this simple, just called gpyopt dot experiment design dot initial design. So, what else do we need here? Hmm, we have a sam initial sample. We have a function, we have a design region, so we are ready to design and to optimize it. And to optimize it, we define the problem, or we define what we actually do. Note that there is a lot of options here for based optimization, and the selection of the best option is, in many cases, you should just try a few ones, and then select the best one. But let's see what, what choice do we have here. Okay, at first we define objective inside the optimizer by design, okay, to evaluate our objective. It's, you can see that there is single objective, there is also alternatives like uh, multiple objectives. Also you need to, to say what model do you use as a regression model. 
GPI opt in some sense inherits what we have in GPI. So usually we just define some Gaussian process models. Also need that we need to, we can specify more options like do we have exact evaluations or we have some noisy function or how much do we optimize we start optimization during optimization of our Gaussian process model and how many output do we have at the end. Okay, we have our model. Now we say that we want to have an optim accusation function. You define optimization function here. It's expected increment, for example, in this case. You define it using our Gaussian process, Gaussian process model, design region, and optimizer, which you define, okay, above. In this case, uh, we just use default choice, but the specified design region. And also note that we need another thing, it's evaluator. Uh, note that in many cases, when you have heavy function, it can be a good idea. Maybe we should uh, parallel this. Maybe we have a cluster with about 100 of computers, and we can evaluate the function simultaneously using uh, all 100 machines. In this case, we can run based optimization in batch mode. So in this case, you need specific algorithms to generate more points because, uh, okay, the usual choice is just put all optimized uh, 100 times and get the points. We will get points that are very close to each other typically. So there's specific criteria to do this in a batch mode to, get, to generate more points at each step. So, okay, let's define all our objects. And now let's collect all the things into one machine that we can run and go directly to our optimum. In base optimizer. We will start with only five iterations and see what's going on. Not that this library is also good for like uh, plotting on what's going on. Like for GPI, we can see what this uh, covariance function is really is. Here we can plot a causation function. And it's really good. Except this, I think that this library is not very, very sophisticated. Can I say, suppose that you can write similar library in one month, I, I hope, most of you. But okay, you, you can, for example, watch here on what evaluations goes and goes on. And you see that using five additional evaluations, you have like 10 points, five initial points and five additional. And you can see here what, okay, we can run it more to see what's going on one more time. And you see here are the points we evaluated our function, like red dots. You see uh, uncertainties of our model, it's bigger here, but it's not very big. Uh, at the end, and you have like accusation function, it's here it looks uh, much like a delta function, and uh, we continue to evaluate it at this point after 10 iterations. So we found a local optima. Uh, not, we can run even more, 25 iterations, and see the results by plotting accusation function and conversions. Not that uh, for our Bayesian optimization to work, we need to reconstruct our model at each step. So after each evaluation, we construct a regression model based on Gaussian process. It's a rather heavy operation, and we need to do it at each step. So if you really need many samples, it can be costly in terms of how much processing time do you have. So it's another reason why this method is not very good if you have, like, very fast evaluations. Irmek. Yeah. Like, general question. Okay. So let's see, uh, let's see the results, and it uh, looks very good here. And also, not that you have usual routines to get uh, what x do we have and what uh, fx do we have at this current step? Okay, 
So let's see what we can do on your own using Bayesian optimization. Note that uh, in utility we have like a specific function to generate uh, history. It's called, let's see what we have in here, run Bayesian optimization. And uh, you should need, uh, you just specify accusation function name here because everything else we took from the top level here. So it's, let's see what we can do here and what we will get at the end. Oh, no, not like this, but like this, for example. Uh, result should be like this. And we add result to our, to what we already had. And the, at the final, you need to compare three different approaches, three different criteria. It's expert improvement, uh, upper confidence bound, and probability of improvement. Note that the last criterion, uh, usually it's not very good because it has two local behavior. Oh, let's. I think I suppose to write to write it too. Mm. Okay. Now we should uh, put similar code but using different criterion here. If you're interested, you will have Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it would be not very good. Like UCB, yeah, here. Can we stop it? Yes. Oh, very good. So it's a good chance to ask some questions while we are waiting for the results. Uh, can you post the solution to this IPython notebook and the previous one later on? Yes, the solutions will be posted at GitHub repo like we did uh, the previous year. <laughs> It's not that uh, complex, actually. Okay. Yeah, not a bit different from what we had previous seminars, no PyTorch. But now I know that there is a library for Gaussian process called uh, GPyTorch, yeah? And you can use it in your favorite backend. For, for base optimization, there is also some GitHub repo on GPyTorch opt. But now it is almost empty, unfortunately. So you can really contribute to development of this branch of science by putting some additional commits on the GPy opt torch library. Oh, I hope we are, we are ready. So we just cut initial sample and see what we have at the end. Oh. So for me, it's like expected improvement is better. And upper constant bound and probability of improvement is not that good. But probability of improvement is even worse than 
our expert improvement. What we see here, okay, uh, maybe I should start it here, is that here is uh, the median value and this is uh, confidence bound for, uh, for quantiles. And we see that uh, for blue line, it's like uh, we have mean value like this and uh, quantiles just even below. For orange line, it's a bit higher. And for uh, green line, it's even higher. We have uh, another exercise actually here. And I suppose we will return to it if we will have time at the end. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I can write it just like XLabel. Thank you for Notion. Like step number. And the second level is current best value. Hmm. Misprint here. You mentioned that one is better than the other. Why you said so? Okay, okay why one is better? Okay, what we need is to minimize some function. So we see what is the optimum value we already have at, for example, step number 10 or 20. So lower curves are better, yeah? So we see here that expert improvement gives the lowest curve compared to other two methods. And uh, for other two methods, we have a bit not that good picture. Not that we confirm our conclusion, not only by looking at, uh, we, not we set average over 10 runs, so we can only not plot these lines, but plot on range of how big uh, uncertainty we had about optima at each time, regarding uh, comparison of 10 runs. And here for blue curve, we plot quantiles and it's like this. So again, it is the lowest area compared to other two. For upper confidence bound, we have a bit higher curve, but it is not that bad if we compare it to probability of improvement, which is not good at all when we see here. So, okay. Mm. Actually, uh, this uh, figure is quite typical, in my opinion. Expert improvement usually does better. Upper conscious bound is not that good, but the right choice of parameter beta can significantly improve the result. And the second exercise we will not do is about this. And probability of improvement uh, is not that good. Historically, I suppose it was the first. But now we have better alternatives. Okay, let's, let's skip this part. Now let's go to interesting one. It's, I like to actually base optimization because we don't need even many data to see. To see what's going on. We don't need like ImageNet. We don't need even some, we need only one data set. And now we can see if we can optimize hyperparameters and we can choose what the best algorithms we have, for example, random forest. So we will see how to tune parameters of gradient boosting in the second example in our seminar. Let's see what data we have. It's like uh, some credit scoring problem from Kaggle like 5,000 points here. And, okay, we extract inputs as points and outputs as targets. And we want to construct a classifier. Note that we can run standard function from Escalorn to get result of cross-validation. In this case, we use scoring Rockaook, put initialization of our classifier, inputs and outputs, and now we are ready to see what the mean Rokaook value is with default parameters. Hmm. 
Now let's see if we can improve this results using Bayesian optimization. Note that here we have a more complex domain than we had for one dimensional example. We see that here we have like continuous variable, we have discrete variables, it's number of trees in the ensemble, and we have another continuous variable, it's some sample of how big is the part of the sample we use during construction of each decision tree at each step of our gradient boosting. Okay, maybe we can improve more by optimization of different parameters, we will see. Mm, usually, okay, I wrote a function that evaluates all these things, and it's uh, a recommended way to do this, as far as I know. So you just write a function that evaluates your favorite score here, and parse uh, hyperparameters to form, to put them into classification, train, fit the model, or cross-validate, and get the results. So basically, we start with parsing of, right there, of parsing of parameters from our dictionary, from our space. And then we run, uh, we set the parameters for our classification model, for our lighting BAM gradient boosting model, yeah. What for we need test score list if we D d d uh, don't return it, we return test score just. Hmm. <sighs> okay, in this case, uh, yeah, it's maybe a bit back, but okay, it should work here. Uh, not that by default, uh, the problem is that we should put two-dimensional list of parameters in our optimization. It uh, was created to handle, in a normal way, uh, the, if we want to optimize batch of points simultaneously. So in this case, we can run uh, the model with first uh, set of parameters and so on and so on. And this is the requirement by the library. In my opinion, in my case, I just required only one test score because I used only one run of the parameters. So yeah, maybe it would be it would be better to return here test score list, but I'm not. Sure. Yeah, let's try and see. It's always very interesting what's going on when I modify my seminar code during seminar. Okay, let's see. So we have this function, and we can get it. Also, need another see another um, tweak is that by default, gpyopt can only minimize. So we, if we maximize rokauk, we need to minimize minus rokauk, and so this function returns not value 0 0.81, but minus 0 0.21 here, to be competitive, to be able to handle minimization instead of maximization. Now that now we can we can avoid specification of most of the parameters we had before. You just can say, okay, let's create Bayesian optimization for this function, uh, for this space of parameters we specified above, and for this accusation function. And this is just enough if we don't bother about other parameters and we don't have specific deep prior knowledge on what we should do. So now we are ready to run optimization in this cell, and we just specify a number of iterations. We should again wait a bit, because, okay, we need to, oh, it's very fast, faster than my own laptop, very good. And we see what's going on with the target function, and at the end we have like minus 0 0.84 value for our Rokauk score. Also, we can plot convergence, as we did for one-dimensional problem, and see that, hmm, it's like a like good value, and we can improve it for about, like, five steps. Not that, yeah, there is a bit of what, not that we have another parameter for optimization here, if you run it, and uh, in, we can uh, stop at early iteration, for example, 
if uh, the optimizer concludes that uh, consecutive axes are too close to each other, and it seems that we don't optimize more, so we just finish in 10 iterations here. And note that uh, this approach for optimization of parameters is as well prone to overfitting as any other method of machine learning. So let's uh, check if we improve for a test sample. We have a test sample in our folder. And we do the similar preprocessing by separating inputs and outputs. And now we can write fit and predict for default classifier. And we can also run our fit and predict procedure, fit using training points and prediction using test points, and see what the rock-out score is for the test sample. And we see that really we improve over what we had before for our approach. OK. Let's try to select another set of parameters and see what will go on. OK? Yeah. We use uh, hyperparameter space, uh, but uh, what for we need uh, hyperparameters design region? Uh, th this uh, very this guy? Yeah. Mm. I suppose we required it if we specified in more depth what we did above uh, for the one-dimensional example. So there is nothing hidden about it. So let just let. It was used uh, before if we want to specify any, like optimizer. And uh, here we can do it if we don't bother about specification of uh, some internal acquisition functions, we just can continue with our hyperparameter space here. So let's, uh, let's try to add more parameters. What? Yeah? OK, what kind of hyperparameter should we use? What do you think? What? Max step? Max depth? Hmm, let's try. It's like this. Yeah, what's the type? Yeah, discrete, yeah. And the main, it's like from 10, 5 to 10, yeah? Yeah? From 1 to 10? Oh, let's, let's see. A range? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, one moment. We'll fix it. Yeah. Yeah, should should be good here. Yeah. And now, okay. And now we optimize our hyperparameters, and simultaneously we can set what's going on for the next cell. We don't have very good methods to specify parameters by hand. We just use like a little right what parameters we want to optimize. And then see what will continue, what is the result of our optimization. Yeah. 
Hmm. So it's even better using this additional parameter. And uh, it's the case for test points. Okay, you can compare it with grid source CV. It's also like uh, a home task. In this case, I suppose everything, every one of you knows about this function. It just, we specify a grid of points and around cross-validation for all the points that belong to the grid using uh, SKLR and default function. And uh, then we can compare this grid source CV for Bayesian optimization. For this problem, Bayesian, pro Bayesian optimization is typically better, but not always the case. It depends on how much parameter do we have. I mean better is the, it is the performance after comparison of uh, similar number of elevations. And in this case, based on optimization, typically better. But okay, it's not always the case because uh, when you are doing some op optimization with parameters, some hyperparameters are not that good because they're not always continuous. Sometimes they are discrete, for example, or even categorical, and we can do nothing better than a random search sometimes. So, okay, be careful about op application of Bayesian optimization and use a test sample or cross-validated results as you usually should do for machine learning. That, this problem and this methodology is interesting and I hope that there will be more successful applications, not just only hyperparameters, because, okay, there are a lot of heavy functions that, yeah, Oh, okay. I suppose it's the end. So, okay, if you un don't have some like very personal question, you can ask it. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm sorry. About, okay, I will go to you later. And more questions, guys? Two questions, yeah, at least. No? Okay, so thank you complete home messages if you are interested in this topic. And if you have more questions, you can join me and Yermiak and Yevgeny this way. Thank you. <laughs>